Hey everyone, today on the final bar, the major equity average is back in the green with the S&P 500 pushing above 4,500. I'll share with you my favorite Warren Buffett quote on market efficiency and what that means for technical analysis. And we will open the final bar mailbag. Do you see the S&P 500 as a huge double top pattern? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really designed to help you capture market inefficiency. And I'll share with you my favorite Warren Buffett quote among many, I'd be a bum on the street with a tin cup if the markets were always efficient. Then nod to uh, and a, and a, uh, a uh, thumbs up to uh, Jeff Hirsch at the Stock Traders Almanac. That was our quote today. Uh, I read that one uh, as much as I can. And when I'm thinking about that quote from Buffett, it's all about how efficient the market participants are, right? There's this theory in market efficiency called the market, uh, the efficient markets hypothesis or the efficient markets theory, which tells you that there's no edge to be gained by analyzing price action because everything's already priced into the markets. The reality is, I feel like that is a very great theoretical way of thinking about investing. But if you've invested an actual day in your life, if you've looked at the charts, if you've thought about the news flow and how that reflect is reflected in price action, it's hard to imagine that the markets are anything but inefficient because individuals and human investors are irrational and that manifests itself into prices moving way above and beyond or way below what we may expect. So the technical toolkit is all about trying to capture those inefficiencies and focus on where the opportunities may lie. Let's get to our market recap today and see what sort of lessons we can get from today's market. Before we get there, by the way, we have a poll going. Speaking of inefficiency and the way that we're wired as investors, if you decide you're bullish, then gather information to back up that opinion. You are demonstrating which behavioral bias, confirmation bias, hindsight bias, bullish bias, or prospect bias. What do you think? Here's the answer, folks. It is the first option, confirmation bias. Bullish bias, I made up. That's just that's just one that I came up with off the top of my head. Prospect bias is sort of hinting at prospect theory, which is something that drives our investment decisions. It's how we experience gains versus losses. Confirmation bias is one of the most prevalent in, the, uh, in, in, in investing. And what that basically means is you tend to make your decision first, and then you try to gather information to validate or to confirm that decision you've already made. As I hope you understand from uh, what we go through on this show, we tend to focus on an evidence-based investment approach, which means you gather evidence first, you look at the weight of the evidence, and then you make your decisions, you uh, position yourself in your portfolio based on the weight of the evidence, recognizing when the evidence changes. And I would argue we're sort of at one of those inflection points right now, speaking with uh, people like Ari Wald, uh, Jeff Huge, now, so many great conversations we've had over the last couple of weeks really focus on that tactical rotation, at least from growth oriented leadership to more of a different sort of uh, experience here uh, starting in the month of August and potentially into September and beyond. Now, whether that's a short term pullback or a long term correction, that's the real debate with my peers in the industry. Let's get to the charts and see what we learned today and how that fits into those uh, theses that we talked about. I mentioned uh, the indexes in the green, and the NASDAQ was slightly in the red earlier today, but was able to regain uh, the, uh, the zero line and push even higher. The NASDAQ composite finished higher by about 0.6%, not quite back above 14,000, but getting much closer. The S&P 500 up 0.9%, closing back above that key 4,500 level. In this sort of environment where you're trying to gauge whether or not a market is reversing trend, I often find it's helpful to focus on a line in the sand, right? That level. And if you focus on that level, for me, 4,500 is a good starting point. As long as we hold 4,500, things are just not getting that bad, right? On a down day, it's just not getting that that, uh, that bad. We start to be unable to hold a level like 4,500. That's when you want to start revisiting a bullish thesis or a more constructive t- thesis. So for now, the S&P holding up just fine. A nice up day, 40 points higher for the S&P getting back above 4,500. Mid caps and small caps all in the green as well. So a pretty broad advance uh, for today if you look at what uh, how things played out. The VIX pushing back down by about a point, uh, 1.3 points lower. So we we're just above 17 on Friday, which is a pretty elevated VIX relative to recent history, right? If you look at 2023, most of the time has been spent, or certainly in the last couple months, we've had a VIX well below 15, down in the 13, uh, 14 range. 
Now we're pushing back higher today, coming off a bit, but still pretty elevated relative to where we've been here over the last couple months in June and July. Let's look at some other asset classes, see how things played out through the course of the day today. 10-year yields moving back higher, 30-year yields as well. Uh, Five-year point actually came off of it. So 10-year yield remaining above 4%. Now we're almost to 4.1%, around 408. The uh, long bond yield around 426. So still sort of uh, you know pushing higher overall as bond prices came off of it. The TLT was down about 1%. Uh, and the dollar index flat from where we uh, finished today on Friday session. Looking at the commodity space, a bit mixed, but a little more red than green, particularly in the metals, right? So you have silver down 2.1%, uh, gold down about a quarter of a percent, copper prices down about 0.4%. Other parts of the, uh, of the commodity space, particularly energy like natural gas, having a decent update today. But overall weakness over strength, particularly in the precious metals, which I think is an interesting development given the uncertainty we have in uh, the equity markets. Given the elevated volatility, I might expect something like gold to be rallying a little better than it is, uh, but it's not. It's sort of uh, remaining at the lower end of the range here. Cryptocurrencies, a lot of chop and a lot of noise. If you look at the left side there on my little preview chart, you can see sort of the choppiness that we had going into the equity trading session. Then as equities rallied, uh, Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum uh, started to come up as well. Bitcoin still below 30000 around 29130 Ether price is right around 1824 as we finish the equity trading session today. Finally, looking at uh, sector returns, communication services kind of came out through the course of the day, finishing strong, pushing higher by about one and a half percent. And that's your top performing uh, S&P sector today. Financials number two, up about 1.4 percent. Berkshire Hathaway reported earnings uh, before the open today. Nice bounce higher, nice really continuation of that uptrend uh, here in recent months, but other areas like insurance companies have been doing quite well in the financial sector. Industrials and REITs kind of tied for third place around 1.2% higher. Utilities, the only sector technically in the red, although it was basically unchanged from Friday's close, followed by energy and utilities all up slightly from Friday's close. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P 500, and we'll go from there and see what sort of action we can uh, tease out. So general sort of discussion we've been having over the last week there are the accelerated trend lines in the S&P. Every uh, couple of months or so, we've been drawing a more steeper slope to the trend line, sort of uh, matching the acceleration in the market going higher in June and July. You can see we broke down through that last week. That was on, uh, let's say, Tuesday's session of last week, where we kind of gapped down through uh, the, uh, sorry, that was Wednesday's session, where we kind of traded down through there. Then Thursday, Friday, chopping around. Here's today's session, sort of staying within that range that we've been in the last couple of weeks. So it's sort of like, uh, you know, big down day on Wednesday. And from there, we've been kind of treading water as there's been uh, stocks moving higher, lower, but netting out to the benchmarks kind of stable through that period. You know, I mentioned like a 4,500 level. That's sort of where we've uh, settled into over the last couple of days. The real line in the sand for me is this down here. It's around 44, 4420. And that would be the 50-day moving average. And that second trend line we drew from the March and the May lows. I think as long as we hold that, this is at, I mean, this is the, 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 technically just a light pullback uh, and remaining above the recent swing low. That would be a pretty constructive sort of the most bullish scenario I see here is we sort of pull back to the 50-day and then rotate higher. That's kind of what the chart of Alphabet looks like. If you look at uh, Goog, other growth stocks that have had really good runs that have pulled back, they're staying above an ascending 50-day moving average. And that's usually the mark of a strong chart. Think of Meta and others. We'll try to get to as many of these as we can uh, through our market recap. Still holding up pretty well, right? And I think the S&P is also. Once that gets below the 50-day moving average, that's where I think you need to really start uh, thinking about further downside deterioration. I would say most likely scenario, in my opinion, given the seasonal weakness and given the overextended nature of the growth stocks, and how they probably have to pull back even further. I think we break the 50-day, get down into that 4150, 4200 range. That would make sense from a lot of different methodologies. That would be a Fibonacci support level around 4180. That would be a 38.2% retracement of the October to July rally. Uh, that would also take us back to the February highs, which is a key sort of level we focused on quite a bit uh, here in the spring before we finally broke out uh, at the end of May, beginning of June. Uh, that also be the trend line off of the October and March lows, all sort of settling in around there, the 200-day moving average, all kind of at that point. So I generally would think of your downside risk is to down in that 4150, 4200 range. Then the question is what happens next? And I think if you listen to 
a lot of the conversations I've been having, uh, you know, a lot of people agreeing, if not all of us, that short-term weakness makes sense given the overextended nature of the market. The question is what happens next? Seasonally, it would tell you August and September, probably pretty weak. October into November, and especially November and December, tend to, be, tend to be pretty strong. So we could set up for yet another fall low before rally into year end. That would be sort of the base case based on the seasonal calendar. We'll see as the price, uh, as the price evolves on its own. Breaking below that 50-day, I think, would be an important uh, bearish sign to, uh, to look for. Now, I was writing uh, my weekly report for my market misbehavior premium members earlier today. And one of the things we talked about was the relative rotation graph. As always, a nod to Julius de Kempner uh, and the stock charts family for designing this visualization years and years ago. And I followed uh, Julius and his work, and it's so fun to have him as a colleague now here at Stock Charts thinking about uh, data and how we're looking at sectors and industries. But, you know, the RRG using weekly data, I think, tells the story of the conditions right now. We've talked about this general rotation away from growth, which is arguably very overextended or has been. You're starting to see some pullback, uh, particularly in technology. Names like Apple selling off last week. Microsoft, of course, has come down. Other areas of the growth space holding up okay. But generally speaking, the, the, the balloon overall, the air is coming out of that one. And you can see the XLY, uh, Consumer Discretionary, XLC, Communication Services, and the XOK Technology all rotating lower. Now, what was rotating higher to sort of compensate for the weakness and the growth, it's the cyclical sectors like industrials, materials, financials, and energy. As we've talked about some of the tactical rotations, we're certainly recognizing that, not just the weakness and growth and the, and the divergences we've seen in growth, but also some of the improvement in areas like financials, uh, in industrials we've talked about, finan uh, excuse me, energy recently with a nice uh, rotation higher, the relative strength improving. So in general, those are the opportunities, I think, that uh, are presenting themselves on a technical basis, underperforming value-oriented sectors that are starting to improve. And I think the source of funds for those kind of names are probably things like uh, growthy stocks like technology. They're really, you know, arguably may have some further to go to complete this tactical rotation or, or profit taking. Now, what's interesting is before we get there, where are you not seeing uh, upside movement in gold, right? And so if the markets are really getting defensive I would expect something like gold, which tends to be a safe haven, particularly when uh, risk assets are struggling, you would see gold start to improve. And you're just not really seeing that. The GLD is sort of making a lower high around 184. Silver price is down even more today, down over 2%. GLD was hanging in there about a quarter of a percent lower. What's interesting about the chart of the GLD is we're sort of settling into a pretty interesting range. And I, I tend to think of a market at any point in one of three phases. You're in an accumulation phase which means you're rotating higher. You're in a distribution phase, which means you're trending lower, or you're in a consolidation phase. And the way that I would say we're in a consolidation phase is if you can draw a rectangle around the price action and it feels like a pretty good way of capturing the movement, then we're in a consolidation phase. I would say that's what gold is doing. After this distribution in May into June, we've now sort of settled into a range. At the upper end, we have the swing high from July and June and also late May, right around 184 for the GLD. On the downside, we have the June swing low around 176, and that's also the 200-day moving average. So what's interesting is very soon, one of two things most likely happens. Either we rotate above 184 and break out to retest the previous highs, or we break below the 200-day. And if that one would happen, I think gold as a potential option here is probably a low probability because we're unable to hold support, and now we're back below the 200-day moving average. But I'm watching this to see if the GLD can get above 184 that would certainly indicate probably more of a defensive positioning in equities, more of a risk-off sentiment, and people are, are picking up gold as, a, as an opportunity. There are other areas of the equity space outside of growth that are just looking good enough that I don't think gold necessarily has been a, uh, an attractive option for, uh, for investors. Really good opportunity, by the way, to use our alert system. Set an alert for when GLD breaks below the 200 days. Set an alert for when it breaks above 184. You will be told by the Stock Charts platform when one of those things has happened uh, for now, not happening today. Now, let's look at some of the other uh, markets. The FNGS is one of the ETNs that I like to track. I would, I would caution you about a, an ETN like this because uh, as an investment vehicle, and the reason is because the liquidity, right? So not a lot of assets under management as a result uh, relative to things like the SPY and the QQQ. So do your due diligence and, and anything that's not an ETF, an ETN, there can be different structures you just want to be, uh, you want to be wary of and aware of for sure. So full disclosure, I would do your due diligence on something like this. I like using FNGS as an indicative 
uh, price series really did just track the performance of the FANGs as a group and see how they're doing. And, and what, what strikes me on the chart of FNGS is the bearish divergence, right? Higher highs June and July, lower peaks June and July in momentum. And so that higher price, weaker momentum is a classic bearish momentum divergence. We've seen that on a lot of individual charts as well. And I think that is the reality for uh, the growth leadership. The chart of Apple sort of shows you the downside potential once a bearish divergence sort of comes to fruition, once you really see that follow through. And of course, last week we had earnings which disappointed. Friday, we gapped lower below the 50-day moving average. Today can be a very telling session because once you have the big sell-off, the gap lower. We had all weekend to sort of digest that uh, sort of news flow. What happens on Monday? Do investors come in super excited to buy Apple at a discount from where it was a week earlier and buy in around 180, you know, one, we'll call it 182, 183? Or do they continue to sell? And the latter is what actually happened. Apple actually continued lower, pushing to the downside yet again today. Another big down day, the stock down another 1.7%. So not the end of the world. It's still holding above the 200-day moving average, we still are, again, uh, you know, taking, uh, you know, coming down off of significant gains uh, over the last six months. But the reality is the price momentum has certainly shifted, now oversold as of today's close. And I would argue that probably begets further weakness. Now, you can also see weakness in charts like Microsoft, which are failing to hold their 50-day moving average. Microsoft still hanging in there, okay, and hanging on to the June and July swing lows. We sort of bottomed out there and, and chopping, sort of holding, uh, holding ground, treading water around 325, 330. But again, not too far away from looking like a pretty ugly chart a la Apple, which is now broken clearly through support with no real floor uh, obvious on the chart. Now, other FANG stocks, of course, hanging in there okay. And this is why that FANG ETF is doing just fine. Meta continuing to make higher highs and higher lows. Alphabet, as I mentioned, continuing to make higher highs and higher lows. Alphabet was up 2.7% uh, today. That was one of the reasons why the XLC was the top performing sector. So charts like this are still holding in there. So in general, I, I would remind you, when you're looking at any chart, like Meta or Alphabet or Apple or Home Builders or Gold Stocks or whatever, as long as the charts continue to go higher, let the chart tell you when the trend is changed. And with some of these, they're still actually fairly constructive, making higher highs and higher lows. Get concerned when that pattern changes. And that's what I think is we're running into with some of the mega cap technology stocks. Just to finish off, a couple earnings names after the close today to keep an eye on. PLTR, Palantir Technologies, is a software name. Again, it's sort of a familiar pattern. Uh, higher highs, but weaker momentum. So it's short, sort of showing the bearish momentum divergence we've seen elsewhere in the technology space. We'll see what happens during the earnings report, but I would be, in the short term, certainly watching the 50-day moving average. If we do get any sort of downside reaction to earnings, can it hold 16, which would be the July swing low, also the 50-day moving average? Lucid coming in after the close as well today. Now, from a technical perspective, I think there's been a lot not to like about the chart of Lucid because it's been in an established downtrend for quite some time. It broke below the 200-day moving average back at the end of July of 22 and has remained in a position of weakness. You know, if you're buying a chart like Lucid now, it's only because it's gone down a ton and not, I would argue, because the technicals have improved to any significant degree. Now, around earnings is when you can often get an upside surprise. So we'll see if, uh, if we get an upside move from uh, something like Lucid. Tesla, of course, in that same group, gapped lower about two weeks ago and has continued to deteriorate today, closing below the 50-day moving average for the first time since mid-May. That's it for our market recap. Again, a lot of earnings to, uh, to digest as we wrap up earnings season. A lot of things to think about through the course of this week with the CPI number uh, coming out later this week uh, as well. So we'll continue to monitor these charts and focus on the most important movements to uh, pay attention to. We're going to open the final bar mailbag here in a moment. Before we do, a couple quick announcements. First off, our mailbag is filled from questions. So those questions come from people like you running into issues, running into questions as you are analyzing the markets of interest using technical analysis. Email is the best way to get your questions to us. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email address. On Twitter, just tag us in a comment at final bar SCTV. And on YouTube, of course, just drop a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel. We would love to hear your feedback and especially your questions. I hope to answer your question in our next mailbag segment end of this week on Friday's show. I'm going to be leaving in just in about an hour to go to the airport, head down to Las Vegas for the money show. I'll be there the next two days. Excited to catch up with some of my mentors, people like Tom DeMarc and Larry Williams 
um, John Bollinger and many others who will be speaking at the event as well. I'll be doing a 30 minute session Tuesday afternoon uh, talking about some of the key charts I'll be watching between now and year end. And then on Wednesday, I'll be doing a special two hour premium masterclass focusing on a technical analysis checklist. What checks should you be doing every time you look at an individual stock or ETF? You can sign up for both of those sessions, by the way, at stockcharts.com slash money show. And if you do make it to Las Vegas, make sure you say hello after uh, one of those sessions. It'd be great to meet some of you guys in person if you're there uh, attending the event. Let's continue on with our final bar mailbag. Thanks again, everyone, for all the great questions that you've been sending in. And let's get to question number one. Dave, how would you manage stock positions in periods like this one? And I summarized a really thoughtful question that one of you shared with me, just thinking about, you know, a more strategic versus technical question, right? If a lot of the conversations we've been having are correct, and if we do get a tactical drawdown, if the S&P goes down 5 to 10%, like uh, my conversations with uh, Jay Wood sort of uh, ended up at, uh, you know, what do you do? And, and I would say, to be honest with you, um, you know, it depends on your time frame. I think that's the key thing to remember, right? If you are a short-term trader, if you're a swing trader, then I would be focusing on tools, focusing on levers you can pull to manage that downside and risk and expect some sort of further deterioration. What can you do to either, you know, play the short side of technology, play the long side of some of those value-oriented sectors like financials and energy that are starting to, to rotate higher. But if you're more of a medium-term, long-term investor, which I think many of us uh, are, myself included, you need to think about what the tactical time frame means relative to the time frame you're really trying to operate on, which is looking months down the road, if not a little bit further. And if that's the case, I would argue, if you look at the seasonal tendencies in a pre-election year, if you look at the strength underlying this market, besides the fact that we're short-term overextended, if you look at a lot of the strength underneath the hood, I would argue this is probably more of a buying opportunity over time, right? And again, full disclosure, do your due diligence and all the necessary disclaimers on that. But I think, you know, recognizing your time frame, what you expect from the charts, and then how that should inform your decision making in a portfolio, I think is key. So for me, I'm, I'm focused on growth stocks that are breaking down. We've highlighted some of those like Apple and Microsoft. I would be lightening up and, you know, personally, I'm, I'm you know, leaning away from things that are no longer working as always. And I'm certainly finding plenty of opportunities. It's in some of those cyclical sectors that we've highlighted on the show, like energy, like financials, like industrials, things like home builders continuing to do, uh, to do well. So uh, I, would, I would be focusing uh, there. In terms of earnings, you also asked in your question about earnings. And I would say, to be honest with you, that is more of a case-by-case -case basis. I don't have a general way that I approach earnings season and saying, this is what I want to do when a company's reporting. I just know that if I'm going to hold a stock through earnings, you better have a really tight grip on the risk versus reward. You have to remember on earnings, you can have an upside surprise or a downside surprise. Think about some of those technical levels and recognize whether you'd be willing to hold a stock if it goes down in your worst case scenario. And if not, why don't you wait and, uh, and, and get back in after earnings? Some of my conversations with people like Tom Boley uh, and uh, who else, Daniel Shea, have focused on trading around earnings. I'd encourage you to review some of those conversations as well. Next question, Dave, would you label Hershey Foods, HXY, as a descending triangle? A really good question. Let's bring up a chart of this one. I have not looked at this one, full disclosure, before, uh, before now, uh, formally in a while. So let's take a look. So initially looking at the chart of Hershey's, I definitely don't see a descending triangle. And I'll tell you why. A descending triangle would be a flat support level, right? So if you have, like, so if, if uh, it kind of went down here, I'll see if I can draw what a descending triangle would kind of look like. It would look kind of like this, right? So if you kind of did this, that would be sort of a descending triangle, right? So you have a consistent support level and a declining uh, resistance level, right? So flat support, declining resistance, that would be a descending triangle. And a break below that um, sort of bottom end of the triangle would be the built big sell signal. Now, having said that, that's not what we see here. I would argue this is more of, a, of an inflection point from a rally phase going into the high in May to more of a distribution. I don't know if there's a particular pattern that I would identify here. You might be tempted to call this like a, um, an, a head and shoulders top, although it's, it doesn't take that much time. So I don't know if I would probably agree with that as I'm, I'm talking myself out of it as I'm doing it. Like I could see someone labeling this as sort of a head and shoulders top, but it's not my favorite because the left shoulder is not very well um, uh, uh, established at all. So I would probably just call it a trend that's reversed. And I think the problem with a chart like Hershey's is whether you draw a trend line off of these lows, that's broken. 
If you use the 50-day moving average, that's been broken, retested, and failed. If you look at the 200-day, we've now tested that and failed. So the problem with charts like Hershey's is I would argue they're in a clear distribution phase. And I would describe a distribution phase as we're below moving averages, we're making lower lows and lower highs. The momentum uh, in terms of the RSI tends to be below 50, which means weakness and, uh, and stronger down days than up days. Hershey's is a chart in a distribution phase. However you label the pattern, I think recognizing the trend is what's so important. And the reality is, what's the benefit? What's the reason to own Hershey's here from a technical perspective when you have other charts that are actually fairly constructive? And in general, I'm, I'm going to want to rotate to stronger charts and stronger positionings that are outperforming. And, uh, and Hershey's probably the most damning form of evidence on the chart. The relative strength has been down the last three months. You're underperforming by owning HSY here, and that's why I think it's a, it's a difficult chart. That's why consumer staples, by the way, is not a great relative bet. Charts like Hershey's are, uh, are in that sector. Next question. Dave, how can I track changes in the scooter rankings over time? Uh, really good question. You're asking about the scooter reports, uh, and, and it seemed like a static report. I'll show you a couple, a couple things to keep in mind. On our Stock Charts websites, click on Charts and Tools, and on the right column, you want to go down here to Scooter Reports. This is going to default to intraday data. So if, I, if I'm looking at this uh, to start, I'm looking at the strongest uh, large cap names. You can change the universe here at the top. And I'm sorting it in descending order. So the strongest scooter rankings are at the top. And again, this is our Stock Charts technical ranking. It is a proprietary ranking system. If you hit the little magnifying glass and type SCTR, you'll see some articles in our chart school. Uh, that focus on the methodology. We'll share the formulas that we, uh, that we use. It combines different timeframes as a percentile ranking to really compare stocks on an apples to apples basis using trend analysis. And, and it's a really uh, simplistic but powerful way of recognizing strength versus weakness. Now there's this column right here, which says change. This is actually looking at the intraday change in the scooter rankings. So today, as I'm, as I'm running this, Monster Beverages was the biggest gainer. It gained 23 points in its scooter ranking. So it means yesterday it was around you know, 46, and today it's around 69th percentile, so a nice move higher. And you can, of course, look at the biggest drops in the scooter ranking as well. Today it was bill.com. Now up here, you can say one week. So we also give you an additional time frame, in which means this column called change is now looking at the one week change in the scooter ranking. So you can see what stocks have gained the most or lost the most in their scooter rankings. That's a really helpful comparison uh, to use with the uh, Dow Jones industry. So now I can say which industry groups gained the most in the last week. It's things like insurance companies, which have had a nice move higher, telecom stocks, non-durable household products. So it's a great way to identify uh, groups of stocks that are starting to improve on a relative basis. Now, the last thing I'll show you with this, because it's sort of uh, still in testing mode, but we're beta testing and we're able to show it to you. If you go to your dashboard, if you're a Stock Charts member, Click on the redesigned market carpets. I am super, super excited once we get this ready. It's still in testing mode, so don't, don't draw too much on this just yet. But you can say measure scooter rankings. We can say multiple time frames. We can say a two-month time frame, one day, five day, whatever it is. You can change the color scheme. This one called vanilla, I'm starting to really like. So the, the deepest red and the brightest green sort of jump off and the neutral is sort of uh, this uh, vanilla color. But it's a great way of recognizing shifts in the scooter rankings at a very high level and focus in on some of the groups and areas of the market showing improvement over different time frames. These are just test uh, data points that we're bringing in here. Eventually, we have a lot more choices for period and for the type of data. And I think eventually our updated market carpet, which hopefully is released very, very soon, will be the perfect way to answer your question of understanding and recognizing shifts in the scooter rankings over time. Next question, Dave, do you see the S&P 500 as a big double top pattern? Um, such an interesting question. And the short answer is uh, maybe, I think, is the, is the answer, right? I mean, could it be a double top pattern? 100%. I think if you take a step back from looking at the S&P and you look back over time, right, there are a number of times where the S&P has tested a significant resistance level. I would argue at the beginning of October of 2018, that was a retest of the early 2018 high that failed. Um, if you look back at 2000 to 2007, the S&P kind of testing a significant resistance level and failing then the breakout in 2013 was a big time uh, indication of a new secular bull market, I would argue, now looking back. So could we retest this high? Is this a retest? I think very much it could be. And I would say I'd be hesitant 
to be talking about much further upside of any sort for the S&P until we can get above 4,800, right? That resistance level is key. That is the end of the COVID rally. That's when the Fed uh, was doing a very different thing. This is sort of pre-rate hikes. Uh, and so a lot of things have changed in the last 18 plus months since that high at the end of 2021. In terms of what the market conditions are, I would argue, I think the question mark I would have for the S&P breaking above 4,800 to 5,000 and beyond is are things really that much better now, right? Versus where they were at the end of 21, where we topped down and started rotating lower. Economic conditions have arguably gotten a lot worse. We've seen the economy slowing down in no small part because of the action of the Fed. The growth stocks that have been rallying, are they really in such a better position now than they were at the end of 2021? I think that's the question you want to be asking as a longer term, uh, more uh, secular uh, investor. I would argue not, not at this point, right? I'm still seeing a lot of question marks in terms of the sustainability of an uptrend beyond uh, the, uh, the high from the end of 2021. When a market hits all-time highs or all-time lows or significant levels, that's when it's logical to take a step back and just think about the conditions and how they relate. And that would, those would be some of my concerns. Could it be a double-top pattern? Absolutely. And I would say whether or not it, I would label it as a double-top pattern, the conditions we've talked about, the breadth conditions, the rotational patterns between leadership from growth to value, I think those are the themes that really probably create a very double-top-like pattern here for the next six to eight weeks, most likely. Last question, then we got to wrap it, folks. Uh, can you interpret, or how do you interpret the chart of AGCO, A-G-C-O? Is this a megaphone or a broadening top pattern? So first off, I want to thank you for sending in this question. You pointed out the chart school that we have on stock charts doesn't have an entry for the megaphone top or the broadening top. I actually think you're right. So I'm going to be talking with uh, the, uh, um, uh, the person who runs our, uh, the content portion of our website, thinking about that area of the chart school. Maybe you'll see an article popping up there uh, very, very soon uh, to recognize that as an important pattern. You know, what does it mean? I think your chart of AGCO, you're demonstrating kind of a classic broadening top pattern. That's where you have a rally and then if you think of a symmetrical triangle or a coil pattern is where the range sort of narrows, right? We have lower highs, higher lows, and we're sort of settling into an equilibrium. A megaphone is kind of the opposite of that. So instead of the range narrowing, the range is actually widening. So you're getting higher highs and lower lows. The reason why we don't talk about it a lot is it's actually much more rare than you might expect or, uh, you know, it doesn't happen particularly often. Megaphone tops in, in terms of a true uh, megaphone, a true broadening top are a lot less likely than you might expect. What I would say, though, is I think of a broadening top as less of a true expansion in the range and more of subsequent retests of that initial range. So if I think of the high from AGCO in January and the low in March, not to uh, you know, draw on your chart with my own annotations, but it's my chart now, so let's do it here. I would say a level that I would more, uh, the way I would be thinking more about it is this down here is sort of a retest of the, um, of the, of the support, right? So there's that support in March and then in April. I would say this is a failed breakdown of support. And then up here, I would basically see the high in January, a retest in March that failed, and another retest in July. So I tend to think of a broadening top less as a, an expansion of the range and more as attempts, you know, failed breakouts and failed breakdowns. In either case, it's, uh, it tends to indicate a market in equilibrium and you look to where we break out of that pattern. So I would be looking for a break above sort of that 136.50, 137 level, but sustaining that breakout and or a break below 112, which would take us below the range to the downside. Until then, I think this is a chart in a consolidation phase in that third direction of sideways. That's it for our uh, mailbag. Thank you guys so much. Some really thoughtful questions making me think uh, about how to address them. I really appreciate uh, the uh, questions you guys are bringing in. We need to wrap the show and go to the three and three. Three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. You know, it's so interesting. We talked a lot uh, last week about breadth indicators. We highlighted the bullish percent index, which had turned negative for the NASDAQ 100. We talked about the McClellan oscillator, showing that the advanced decline data was getting a little uh, less bullish and a little more bearish, more in line with previous pullback phases. One of the things that I was looking at over the weekend was the highs versus lows. So this is looking at the New York Stock Exchange every day, how many new 52-week highs versus new 52-week lows. Notice how this still has remained above zero. Even though the market's chopped down a little bit, there's still way more new 52-week highs than new 52-week lows. Now, I'm showing those data series separately. Here we have 
uh, new highs and new lows for the New York Stock Exchange. At the bottom, new highs for the S&P and new 52-week lows for the S&P in green and in red, respectively. There's still plenty of stocks making new swing highs. As a matter of fact, on Friday's session, it was 20 S&P names. That's only 4% of the S&P, but it's not zero. And there are very few S&P stocks making a new 52-week low. So even though we've started to pull back a little bit, don't, you know, I, I think this chart tells you, or it's a good reminder that there are plenty of stocks still working. And as always, I like sticking with trends that are working. Get out of charts that are no longer working. That should be the focus of your technical discipline, in my opinion. Chart number two, I looked at the FANG plus ETN from Microsectors, ticker FNGS. Again, I'm not a huge fan of ETNs because anything that gets away from an ETF is becoming less and less stable. There's some assumptions that they're making with a model uh, to get certain exposure. So I'm less optimistic about using a product like that. But for an indicative value, recognizing the uh, trend in a particular group, I think they're fantastic. And when I look at this group of FANG stocks as, as reflected in the FNGS, I'm seeing a clear bearish divergence, which is the red flag, the warning sign. Now I'm looking to see if we get a breakdown below the 50-day. While Apple and Microsoft have broken down, the FNGS has not because some of those other uh, FANG stocks are actually holding up okay. I would look there to see if that rotation away from growth that we've talked about actually plays out. Finally, let's look at value versus growth using some ETFs. I'm using IVE and IVW. These are the S&P 500 value and growth ETFs coming from iShares. Overall, this ratio going lower for through the course of most of 2023 tells you growth has been outperforming or value has been underperforming, but it's certainly been more sideways in June and July as value stocks have started to do a little bit better, potentially rotating and breaking out. And again, when I talk about that rotation, we looked at that RRG graph about the uh, you know, the, the uh, value sector is starting to improve. That could be reflected in this ratio going up as well. Here in uh, blue, we have the relative performance of the financial sector. Look at how that is improving on a relative basis. Here in green, which is ironic, I get is energy, XLE rotating higher as well. So I think looking for opportunities in some of those underperforming sectors that are really starting to improve in the last four to six weeks could be an interesting opportunity here going forward. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. We'll be in Las Vegas the next couple days. We'll continue to do our show remotely. As a reminder, we'll be doing our next YouTube live Q&A next week on Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern. So set a reminder now in your calendar to join us. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a great one. Oh, hello? Warren. Yeah, it's Dave. How are you? Things in Omaha.